I'm Emil Geeson, a former British Royal Marine Commando. I've swapped my rifle for a camera and now become a documentary filmmaker. Ukraine is a country on the edge of Europe and only three and a half hour flight from the UK. Since gaining independence from the Soviet Union in 1991, tension has grown between Eastern Ukrainians who identify as Russian and the rest of Ukraine who have closer ties with Europe. This came to a head in February 2014. Pro-European riots in Kiev ousted the pro-Russian president. 103 civilians and 13 police officers were killed. On the 27th of February, masked Russian troops moved into annexed Crimea from Ukraine. In the eastern region of Donbass, pro-Russian separatists amassed against Ukrainian government. Fighting soon broke out against separatists loyal to Russia who wanted Donbass to break away from Ukraine. Moscow denied having anything to do with the uprising. This is where the war started in 2014. I'm here in Ukraine to meet international volunteers that are fighting in Europe's forgotten war. Come here, you want to help the country, you want to help fight a country for a country's freedom. I admire that. We've got rounds going straight over the head here. You want to come to another country and uh, kill people just to make yourself feel better because you miss war, because you want to prove something to yourself, you want to prove yourself to be a hero. Uh, maybe go somewhere else. Do people have uh, this? mentality of fighting the big man, of, of I'm going to put it all on the line to go help the, the innocent, the poor, the humble, um, to have some sort of Robin Hood complex, maybe. I've arranged to meet David. He's a former US soldier who now lives in Kiev. At the start of the war, he went to the front line to join the Ukrainian military fight against the pro-Russian separatists in the east. Um, there were guys that came here that had never served in the military and did honorable or dishonorable things. Most of the people that are doing good things are still here. And some of the people that in 14 and 15, or maybe even the beginning of 16, that had uh, maybe the not, not the best motivations have already gone back home. And that's, that's a good thing because Ukraine doesn't need more problems, they have enough. I'm struggling to find any volunteer fighters that will go on camera to talk or assist me getting to the front line myself. I'm told I should speak to Craig. He's an American volunteer who fought during the war for the far right, but he's no longer in Ukraine. Hello, Hello mate. A lot of people that originally came to Ukraine, they, they came here with the thought of, you know, they wanted to help, they wanted to make a difference, you know, they wanted to, they saw it wrong and they wanted to right it. I think some people just come for training. I think some people just come for an experience. I think you have a lot of people that are just worthless fucking war tourists. So it's, I mean, it's difficult to say. I mean, you got some people out there that they really want to help out. They really want to be a part of this. And they don't get to be because of all the politics and all the bullshit that's going on. But then you got some people that they come with ulterior motives. You know what I mean? Well, yeah, if you can see if you can find out anyone is floating about, they'll be up and speak with them. It'd be brilliant. All right, right now, there are zero Western foreign volunteers out there. They have left. Why have they left, though? Because the war got too slow. When you look at how things were in, like, 2014, 2015, it was, it was, a, it was a very active war. There's still a lot going on. It was an active war zone. When you got into, like, 2016, 2017, it mostly just became trench warfare, man. It, it slowed down. It, it was no longer... You're going out and you're, you're taking towns, you're taking positions. It was now, we're going to send a trench and we're going to dig to the enemy trench. You don't think there's any Western volunteers from Britain, America or Europe that are fighting on the front line at the moment? Um, I'm going to tell you right now, I think no. I think everybody's gone home. So it was interesting there what he's saying and his experience of finding that. 
A lot of the Western volunteers who came out here with intentions to fight have lost interest because the static front lines is a stalemate between two trench systems. And there's no movement left or right. So a lot of these volunteers have decided to go home. Just on the way now to meet a group, the Georgian Legion, made up of Western volunteers, uh, men from Georgia. Russia invaded Georgia in 2008, and these men are quite passionate to talk to me um, to explain why they're here in Ukraine to fight. By 2008, the relationship between Russia and Georgia had weakened. On the 1st of August, South Ossetian separatists loyal to Russia started to rise up. The Georgian military responded by sending troops to restore order. The Russian military accused Georgia of aggression against South Ossetia and launched a large-scale air, sea and land invasion with 70,000 troops. Georgian troops soon withdrew. The areas of Ossetia and Abkhazia were recognised by Russia as independent states, leaving many Georgians angry with what they call Russian regional aggression. The Georgian Legion's headquarters is located on an ice skating rink in Kiev. I've been told there are many international volunteers here with them. The commander Mamuka explains why he and his men have come to Ukraine to fight against what they call the Russian invasion. So 20% of what you see on a map is occupied by Russians. Mamuka tells me that he welcomes volunteers from all over the world into his ranks and that Western volunteers give morale to his men. Alex is a former American soldier who is now with the Georgian Legion, has been fighting on the front line. So what motivated you to come to this particular war? Uh, well, you know, that's a uh, pretty uh, complex question you ask. That Russia has basically invaded uh, Ukrainian uh, sovereign uh, territory. Um, you, you're an American citizen? Yes, that's correct. But your country invades countries? Oh, uh, yeah. I would, so uh, why is that I, okay for America to invade nations, but not Russia? Oh, I guess, look, I guess the bottom line uh, if you really want to go there, it would be, uh, you know, my country's particular uh, interests in uh, whatever it is that they're going about, um, you know, is only, uh, well, good for me. But did you see Russia as an enemy? I wouldn't say an enemy per se. I just would say what they have done to annex Crimea, uh, will it end with, uh, you know, the separatist state of uh, Donetsk and Luhansk, or will it continue to impede forward into Europe? So how do you feel about other volunteers coming to Ukraine? I honestly uh, would definitely deter vo uh, foreign fighters and volunteers who come here do not have military experience or professional training. A lot of times guys come here, they might have some type of, uh, you know, uh, aspirations or some type of um, political means or ideological agenda, something romantic about the warfare that's going on here, have a uh, hero's complex about them. It's obvious that they're in over their head, and this is a uh, huge concern. Despite that the Georgian Legion welcomes international volunteers, they currently don't have permission from the Ukrainian military to fight on the front line. These men that come from all over the world are just sat around waiting. Bar is a volunteer from Israel. So you've got the Georgians out here who have got a problem with Russia, but how do you feel about the British and Americans and the Germans that come here? We're doing this for Ukraine, for people of Ukraine, not for government, not for uh, glory. It's, uh, these guys is not mercenaries. You must understand this. Uh, most of people think that uh, these guys are mercenaries. They don't mercenaries. They don't ask for money. These guys with a lot of military experience. And I don't understand why uh, Ukraine don't using this, uh, this experience for good purposes. So your idea for you before? Yes, ma major in, in the reserve. Okay, so how long were you in the reserves for? In Israel, you in you serve uh, until you die. Until you die? Yeah. Uh, it's alive. a joke. No. Yes. Two weeks after filming with Barr, he was found dead in his apartment in Kiev. The police say he took his own life, but many of his men here from the Georgian Legion claim it was a Russian assassination made to look like a suicide. However, there is no evidence to support this.
The reason these volunteers are not being allowed to go to the front line is political. In February 2015, Ukraine, Russia, France and Germany, under the Minsk II Peace Agreement, agreed measures to stop the ongoing war. One of these measures was the withdrawal of all foreign mercenaries, guns for hire as such from both sides, stopping these volunteers from taking up arms in this conflict. So the guys here are just doing their daily training while they wait to go to the front line. There's still a lot of paperwork issues they're having because they're Georgian and the Ukrainian military doesn't particularly want foreign fighters here in this battle, but they seem to be ready, waiting for the order to go forward. You can see you guys are experienced. Uh, they have uh, experience in uh, city fights uh, or in field fights. So they're good professionals, most of them. Many Western volunteers have come to join the Georgian Legion, thinking they'll get the opportunity to fight, but only to be disappointed and start looking for other units they can get to the front line with. There are many volunteers in Ukraine that were in Syria and Iraq fighting against Islamic State. So how is it compared to Syria then? Well, the difference from like Ukraine to Syria is in Syria, I think they actually wanted our help. We could actually make a difference there. But you feel like they don't want you really here? Yeah, it's more of a hostile environment. The Ukrainians don't really appreciate us and they're more nationalistic when it comes to use. So you're quite frustrated then? Oh yeah, absolutely. Well, I spent all the money to get here from America, money on gear. Went to try two different places and just, they don't want us here at all. As volunteers, would you recommend guys coming out here or no, absolutely not? Not, absolutely not. It's just a waste of money, pretty much. Yeah. Cause it's all your own money, that's the thing. Oh, yeah. I saved up for a couple of months before I came out here, bought thousands of dollars in equipment. Cause leaving Syria, you can't take your equipment. Yeah. Because if the Peshmerga catch you, they'll know you're military and all that. But that's the thing is, a lot of people back home who watch these um, programs and they see you on, online, they think that you're getting paid. They think oh, you're yeah. mercenaries. But the case is that guys with YPG, Peshmerga, Ukrainians, you all fund it yourself. Yeah, we're all funding it. 100% self-funded. You've done Syria, you've now done Ukraine, yeah. and now you're going to Africa. Would you say you're like a career volunteer? Yeah, I'd say so. Well, it's just bad people always find good, can find ways to fight people. So I think good people should find a way to fight the bad people. Do you see yourself as this uh, freedom fighter for these people? I'd say, if, I wouldn't say a freedom fighter. Just, just <laughs> I just like helping people. Cole is disheartened that he isn't getting a chance to fight with the Georgian Legion. He tried to join the Ukrainian National Guard. Even though Karl fought in Syria against Islamic State as a volunteer fighter, the Ukrainian military says he has enough experience, so he's now planning on leaving Ukraine. You're saying there you wouldn't recommend volunteers coming out here? Because no, it's unless you have like a solid contact as Ukrainian general. Yeah. Other than that, they're not, it's not going to work. Because we went all the way to Mariupol, to Azov, we didn't have enough experience to get in. So you say morale is quite low? Oh, geez, yeah, yeah. Because you don't get, there's not enough food. You're using your hands for weapons because you can't get training weapons. There's just a lot of fucking, there's a lot of hiccups in the. A lot of red tape. Oh, absolutely. I wrote letters to US senators and to Congress and that didn't help. Trying to help these guys yeah, out. Yeah, trying to help these guys out. We just, we did a lot for them, but just nothing ever happened. So you gotta don't call it quits. You're pissing in the wind, as they exactly, say. Exactly, yeah, pissing in the wind. So what are we gonna do with all your equipment then? Well, the thing is, like going to Europe with equipment is impossible because they might take our skull. Because this is probably. I've got body armor. I have body armor. I have an ACOG in there. I have <laughs> weapon sites, yeah. yeah. The weapon sites. So if I get stopped with that, it's going to look pretty shitty because we never got official documentation that we were here. So we're just like nomads with military boots. So they might actually think that you're yeah. working for the 70s. Exactly. So that's why we have to hide it somewhere, save up some money, fly back. That's another expense, isn't it? Like oh, you're yeah. saying, because you're saying you pay for everything yourself as yeah. a volunteer. You come here, you don't get to fight. And then you've got to give all your equipment away. Yeah, but I'm going to keep it safe because I'm not, because like in Syria, like I said, like we, I give all my equipment to the guys, but here it's just like, if I leave it here, it will get stolen. The same as I saw in Kurdistan, volunteers pay for the flights, their own equipment, and they come here as a volunteer to fight. The problem they've got here is Ukrainian military don't particularly want Western volunteers on the front line. Off camera, stories came out from some of the international volunteers that the Georgians and some of the Western volunteers have assaulted them. Some of the guys were telling me there that they've been attacked by the Georgian Legion. Um, difference in conflict of interest. I think what it is is soldiers, when they're confined, they're frustrated, they want to fight but can't, they turn on one another and there's a lot of internal fighting. It was quite sad and actually to hear how these guys were treated.
I'm told there was a group of British volunteers training with the Ukrainian military. So I decided to board a train from Kiev to Mariupol, which is 17 hours to the east. I feel in order to find out if there's any international volunteers still fighting, I need to get closer to the front line. The problem is I don't have any official paperwork to move around and being told I may be arrested. I need permission to get through certain checkpoints. So hopefully when we get off the train, the guides are there to meet us. I find this group of British volunteers through Facebook and Instagram. They haven't told me their exact location for security reasons. I've managed to narrow their position down. Hopefully when I arrive, they're happy for me to film with them. During the unrest in Ukraine, in the aftermath of the 2014 revolution, the city of Mariupol saw skirmishes break out between the Ukrainian government forces, local police and pro-Russian separatists. The government forces withdrew from the city on the 9th of May 2014, after heavy fighting left the city police station gutted by fire. In 2014, the separatists loyal to Russia came to this area and surrounded this police station. The guys inside were trapped. Two of them were killed. In the end, the Ukrainians came and rescued the rest of them. A month after the pro-Russian separatists took control of this city, Azov, the National Guard, managed to retake the city back. I can sense that not all the people here are happy to be back under Ukrainian control. Despite life returning to normal, the front line is only 10 miles away and in the distance you can hear heavy mortar and artillery fire. The next morning I got a phone call from the commander of Azov, granting me permission to come and film with his unit. They are located 8 miles out of the city. Many of the pro-Russian separatists claim Azov Regiment are a Nazi organisation. The city of Mariupol is quite vibrant. I wasn't expecting there to be so much life there, so close to the front line. Last night from my hotel, we could hear artillery fire. And uh, looking at live maps online, there's been several attacks recently in this area. The battalion we're going to go meet now, the Home Guards Division, who have been held in reserve. They send troops down to the front line. But at the moment now, the commander said his men are back doing some training. From what we've been told, there's three British um, nationals that are going to be there helping the Ukrainian National Guard with training. So we've gone through one checkpoint now. The checkpoint is checking everyone's paperwork to make sure there's no Russian separatists coming into the Ukraine area and also to make sure there's no foreign fighters going out to the other side. keen to show me what they do and claim they are a very different organisation to what they were back at the start of the war. Originally Azov was a volunteer unit back in 2014 but now an official National Guard unit. They claim they no longer have links to Nazism. What they're going to do now is they're going to put me in the glove here and show the attack dog grabbing. I reckon I can take the dog down. Got his paw marks. Next time I get him. Azov tell me they're conducting more and more dog operations in a counter-terrorism role, along with SWAT-style tactics, making them an effective counter-terrorism unit. The soldiers pride themselves on their counter-terrorism operation skills, and they are well equipped and trained. Finally, I get to meet the British volunteers John, Sean, Tony, and Swampy. Swampy is from the Isle of Man, an explosive and ordnance instructor, and has been in Ukraine as a volunteer for four years. He's teaching the other volunteers the latest tactics on IEDs and booby traps that he's finding on the front line. These volunteers bring unique skills to Azov, 
and it's clear the Ukrainians are happy for them to be here. I'm keen to find out why these former soldiers have now become career volunteers. This is what I do. So this is who I am, and uh, I've come here because Ukraine has a right to secure its own borders. And you know, if there's any way that I can assist and help protect their own borders, and also help with the humanitarian side of things, if, you know, when there is time for it, I'll be happy to. From what I've met from volunteers that were in both conflicts, kind of thing, a lot of them, uh, well, some of them, which are misfits from society. <laughs> Generally, the guys who've never been in the armed forces, not all of them, yeah. but there are some guys that are looking for that sense of belonging. Yeah, Do you yeah. feel like you've got that sense of belonging here in Ukraine? I know you haven't been here that long. Uh, but... Mostly here, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Uh, We've made you feel very welcome, haven't we? You can see the difference in the standard of YPG, GL, here. It's very much a structured regime. With the Peshmerga and the YPG as well, there was a lot of volunteers that have no background in the military. Um, were turning up there thinking, probably play too much Call of Duty, seeing that <laughs> yeah. they can get a weapon, they can go out there and fight. Spaceship door gunners. Yeah, yeah and plenty what, of them. Here you can't you can't get away from that, especially you can't that hide Ukrainians that. Yeah, are more you, more astute. So military yeah. force. You can't hide you can't hide in that. You you know, you'll get found out. You'll get found out, yeah. Um so seriously if you, you know you've got to be hundred percent aware of what you're doing and you know you won't you, you won't receive intense training like a basic training programme. And don't just turn up thinking that it's going to be all fun and games. It's going to be like you see on the television, because it isn't. From your previous military experience, you can go out and get jobs as close protection guys, yeah. maritime security. There's, there's work for you out there. Yeah, well, I'm qualified yeah. in that area. And I mean, at the end of the day, I mean, I've done work like that before. I mean, I'm, I'm fully CP badged. Um, and, you know, it, it works. I mean, the, money, the money's dropped out of it, but that's yeah, just yeah, what that's it right. is. But, that's why I'm doing camera work. <laughs> <laughs> but, but the fact of the matter is, is at the end of the day, this is voluntary. Uh, th this is giving something back a little bit. It's not. It's not. It's not glory hunting in any way, shape, or form. It, it is a job, and it sometimes it can be a horrible, cold, wet, lonely, lying in a lying in a ditch job, you know, poking around for things that could go bang. Yeah. Mm. You know, that's what you could be careful of. You've done Syria. You're now in Ukraine. Do you think you're going anywhere else? Where's next for you? Oh, we'll get this over. One more at a time. Yeah. One more. One more at a time. That's it. Yeah. That is normal. The volunteers oh, want to take me to the shooting range, show me them working alongside Ukrainian soldiers. It's clear to see the Ukrainian forces use these former soldiers to train and assist, bringing many Western military skills to Ukraine. Rolling countryside, it could be in Norfolk. <laughs> Undulating grounds. <laughs> yeah. What's the plan today? Shoot some guns. Shoot some guns. Right, Probably shoot some guns. Yeah. yeah. I, bit, I, I, we've got a bit of weapons firing, we've got, we've got a sniper, we've got our uh, tech teams coming uh, in as well. We so, here. Let's see what that happens. Been out to the range to watch these guys test fire the weapons and watch the snipers take up some targets to see how effective they are. So this one here has got a Barrett weapon and it's an anti-material weapon so because he does EOD mine clearance they can use this to shoot at mines from long distance. Because the front line is now static compared to where it was in 2014, snipers are an effective weapon in this war. The Ukrainian forces tell me that they are seeing an increase in pro-Russian sniper attack and claim this is due to Russian mercenaries returning from the fighting in Syria and now taking up positions in the Ukrainian front line. There's a metal plate target, you should actually hear it when they hit as well. So when you get, when you, when you get, when you get a good hit, you'll hear a ting of it. Many of these Ukrainian snipers refuse to show their faces on camera. This is due to the fact that they are identified their families' lives may be in danger. So what they're firing on the range today is the head sniper, he's bought his own 338 sniper rifle. The others are using Dragonoffs and there's a Barrett sniper rifle here with a 50 caliber. So an array of weapon systems here, they're going to be testing and adjusting. So they're just doing training for before they go to the front line potentially. So because the front line is very static, and there's not much fluid movement kinetic, snipers are effective weapons in this battle. So this is the British, the volunteers here, and they're just helping out the Ukrainian snipers. As you can see here, you've got Tony that's spotting. You've got Swampy is on the Barrett sniper rifle, which is used for EOD 
So what Swan people do is he will engage targets like IEDs and mines from long distance, something he doesn't want to get up close and personal to. And we've got Sean here, who's a secondary spotter in the rear. So they are working in conjunction with Ukrainian forces. So when you potentially go to the front line, would this be your role? My role would be to assist with the EOD and also as a secondary, I'd be um, offering myself out for, for spotting um, and helping select targets. I mean, that's, that, that's my role. Also, you know, I'm, I'm a qualified sniper, so. So in the army, you're a sniper? Yeah, I'm, I was in the tank as well. So. Okay, so you, bring, you can bring a lot of experience to these yeah, guys. Yeah. But the thing is, is that, you know, I'm a volunteer out here, so really I've got to make sure that first and foremost that uh, I provide them with the, with the right tools that I can give them. I'm told, due to the lack of funding to units like Azov, a lot of these snipers buy their own weapon system. After a few hours on the range, the snipers head back to their accommodation. Despite these being volunteers, they receive a basic wage of $400 a month. The Ukrainian sniper is a former policeman and was at the riots in 2014 in Kiev. He tells me they was ordered by his commanders to shoot civilians during the riots, something he wasn't prepared to do. So he left the police and joined Azov. When the war began, uh, I decided that I have to defend my country against uh, the Russian intruders, against uh, the enemy, and to uh, come here. Government uh, say to us, insurgents are uh, well trained to uh, militia, uh, that they are trained to buy uh, different uh, Western countries, uh, that they have a weapon. But uh, when we uh, come to Maidan, uh, we said to, that uh, there is a uh, simple guys, simple students, workers, uh, simple people uh, as our friends, uh, and uh, we understood that. Uh, our government is not right. Then, uh, after uh, government forces uh, began to uh, shot uh, with live bullets, with real bullets, uh, I and uh, some other guys decided to leave the police and uh, better to stay at home or join uh, to riot. In police, uh, we swear to defend people. Uh, we didn't swear to kill them for government. I'm keen to see how good these snipers are and how good their field craft skills are. Okay. So what they're doing now is they're taking us now further down and the snipers are going to do some tactical training, like stalking to get close to the enemy without being seen. So what the snipers are doing now is they're doing a stalk, which is camera concealment, where the camouflage, they'll crawl, to get on to eyes onto the target and take their shot so the enemy doesn't see them. This is basic sniper training. Since the start of this conflict, all of these snipers have seen action on the front line. During my military career, snipers were an effective weapon in the psychological battle, sitting in wait to take their shot. Never knowing where the shot came from can have a dramatic effect on morale. I know only too well the damage a sniper can have. We're just moving up with the snipers now, who are just crawling through mud and water and that. This is called a stalk, so what they're doing is they try to get as close as they can to the enemy, set up a position to an OP observation post, and then take a shot onto the target, or observation report back to intelligence. So this is low basic sniper training, but it's fundamental for what they do. In addition to long range shooting and stalking, Military snipers are trained in a variety of tactic techniques. Target range estimation methods, camouflage, field craft, reconnaissance and observation. We are stalking to the position. 
I uh, say them uh, which position uh, they need to. They move up to uh, the right to fire. Yes, uh, to the right and uh, to prepare and for fire. They're firing live rounds, so these guys react to it. So it's those real scenario. But um, in the UK, we generally use blanks. These guys actually using live rounds to fire over the head. So what these guys are doing now is they're practicing tourniquets, putting a tourniquet on, but they're not using real tourniquets, they're using belts as improvising. Okay, we're going to the real the belt. I use the magazine. magazine and make twist. Twist, yeah, for finish the bleeding. It shows how you have to be fit to be a soldier, because I'm hanging out at the moment. It's been a few years since I've done stalking. Um, it was good to see these guys crawling through. The cam and concealment drills are excellent. It's very similar to what we do in the United Kingdom in the British forces. And the scenario there where they're firing rounds over the heads of them, simulated casualties um, and responding to it. And now they're moving the casualty off. But um, yeah, enjoyed that with them guys. Brings back memories. I'm on my way to meet two international volunteers who were with the Georgian Legion, but have both left to join the Ukrainian army. Neither of these volunteers have any previous military experience. They've sent me their location of their training base, which is north of Kiev. I'll be warned that this is supposed to be a secret location and they may not be happy to see cameras. I don't think the commander's gonna let us actually on the base for the checkpoint now. So they've said we can film outside in this area. So we're just gonna wait for them to come out and just do some interviews. So we really wanna find out what motivates these guys to go fight on the front line with the Ukrainian army, especially as these two volunteers have no previous military experience. I don't have the official paperwork to be in this area and my presence is bringing unwanted attention. I wait at the checkpoint for a further 45 minutes and after several more phone calls, the commander agrees for the volunteers to come out and meet me. From my previous experience in Kurdistan, local military commanders are always happy to have international volunteers in their ranks. I sense this commander is proud to show off his two new recruits for the camera. So, so why do guys who've never served in the military, do you think, come to this conflict in Ukraine? Why are they so passionate about it? It's a good chance to serve in the military for someone who hasn't. And if someone wants to be at war, then they best do it in a country that's at war. Do you, do you not want to join the Norwegian military? What, uh, what am I going to do? Go to the Middle East and participate in wars I do not approve of? I'm not... Uh, joining the military to fuck with other people's freedom. I'm joining the military to protect people's freedom. There's a big difference in that. I'm not going to help kill innocent civilians over corporate interests or political games. That's not what I'm about. So how are you integrating with these guys? Very well. There's language barriers, but we're well received and uh, we've become a bit of uh, mascots. You know, everyone's uh, cheerful when we come around and we communicate, there's a lot of charades and a few words here and a few words there. It goes to show that they really appreciate us being here and, uh, you know, they, they take care of us. It's like getting a new family. Being here has the, the aid of these people and how they've taken care of me when I'm here to help them has brought tears to my eyes many a time. People will give the last piece of bread they have to help you. It's amazing. It truly is. War always brings out the best and the worst in people. And uh, I'm here to find that and uh, to find brotherhood and to fight for a good cause. Yeah, the Ukrainians themselves are actually very friendly um, towards Westerners in general, I found. Um, the, not to, you know, point of fingers, the only people that I've seen specifically have any kind of like, you know, hostility or discomfort with Westerners have been people specifically from Russia. Yeah. Any other military force in the world wouldn't take volunteers that haven't previous experience. Why do you think the Ukrainian forces are happy to take guys like yourself? Well, they need help. Well, they're not really getting much real help from the international community. They will handle this. They've stopped the Russians from coming into their country before with worse equipment, worse numbers. And they've been able to stop the Russians before and now they have better equipment, generally better numbers. The effect Ukraine will leave on me will be much greater than the effect I live on, leave on Ukraine. But with my medical experience I do have, maybe I'll be able to have an effect on the life of, you know, two or three people um, over my time here. I would have full on dreams night after night after night after night of being here. 
and, and serving here and it just got to the point where I couldn't get it off my mind. No matter what I was doing during the day, I couldn't get it off my mind being here. People are calling Ukraine the forgotten war. I think I've seen the situation in Ukraine on Norwegian TV maybe 10 times. So what would you say to someone from the US who said you're just looking for direction, a sense of belonging, that said you're a bit crazy if you're coming out here with no military experience? No, I don't uh, fear death at all. I don't, it doesn't matter, you know, if I die here, you know, anywhere else in the world, you know, you're going to die anyway. And, you know, you know I, I know for a fact that if I didn't come here, you know, on my deathbed, I would regret never coming. If I was getting paid very good money, people would then, oh, it's okay to come over here if I'm getting paid good money. But, you know, I'm not doing this for good money at all compared to the United States. Um, it's... At the end of the day, no one comes here, you know, for the money. It's based on the principle. They wouldn't let us in on the base in the end because they said it's a secret location. All it is is a tree line, the wooded area with loads of tents in. It's a battle camp and they're getting ready to go to the front line in the next two to three weeks. The commander was telling me he welcomes volunteers coming here, but the two guys I just interviewed there don't have any military experience. I don't really know why the Ukrainian military would invite them to take them to the front line. It's the thing, the issue I'm noticing here is the same as Kurdistan. There's a lot of these men who just see it as an opportunity, who didn't join their own military, to come to Ukraine as an opportunity to fight. Them two guys with no experience will be fighting on the front line. Since the start of this war, many Russian citizens and soldiers have come to join the Ukrainian military. As well as many Ukrainians have gone over to support the pro-Russian separatists. Some call these people turncoats or traitors. It just highlights how complex this situation is, how it's divided friends, neighbours and families. It's taken me a while, but I finally managed to find a Russian who has defected to Ukraine that will go on camera to tell me what's brought him here to support Ukraine rather than Russia. He doesn't want to use his real name, but goes by the name of Odyssey. Odyssey came to Ukraine during the revolution riots in 2014. In Russia, don't have a, it's not free country it's a, don't have a civilian rights don't have a, um, social lift you know if you uh, if you leak uh, some ass you know <laughs> uh, if you're a good person and you want to make good things you cannot lift up here a lot of corruption you've been on the front line fighting against your countrymen. How, how does that make you feel to fight against fellow Russians? Um, in my opinion, I don't kill them. They make decision to go to war. And uh, Putin's kill them. He make propaganda in Russia uh, about Ukraine, about fascists of Ukraine. Putin's administration make fake news about that. And uh, guys believe in this fake news and go to war. I uh, never fight against uh, Russians uh, uh, like uh, nation. I ne never fight against Russia uh, like uh, country. I fight against uh, Putin's uh, gang, you know, criminal. They send them, they kill them, not me. People in Russia will call you a traitor because you're clearly a Russian citizen. Are you a traitor? I never trade my country. I, I fight uh, against uh, government. I not fight against country. Ukrainian army don't war in uh, Rostov. Ukrainian army war in sight of Ukraine. If, uh, if uh, some guys from Ukraine called me uh, in start of uh, 2014 and said, okay, uh, Odyssey, come uh, to us and we go to Russia, uh, take over the Rostov area and uh, connect to Ukraine. I said, fuck you. I, <laughs> I go defend my country. But it's, it's not like that. They, they, uh, Ukrainian patriots, they fight for their own land. Your father was born in Ukraine. He now is in Russia, working for the Russian government. You were born in, U in Russia, but now in Ukraine. And my mother, uh, he's very sad about it, but uh, uh, after a few years, uh, she understands. She understands me. My mother understands. My cousins, uh, they um, 
say uh, they send me a message in social network uh, I'm a trader, I'm a fascist, I'm a killer Save me all Russian propaganda from TV <laughs> But I don't care, I, uh, I never do uh, those things It's not my style <laughs> It's a war That was an interesting interview with a guy called Odyssey who's from Russia, who's now fighting in Ukraine The interesting thing is that his father was born in Ukraine, but is now a Russian intelligence officer. They clearly don't speak anymore. Why he's here is because he doesn't agree with Putin and the Kremlin's policy on the war in Ukraine. When asked him what it was like to kill Russians, fellow countrymen, he laughed it off and said, well, they shouldn't be in Ukraine. And if they weren't in Ukraine, he wouldn't need to fight them. finally get the phone call I've been waiting for. Ukrainian Marines have agreed to take me to the front line. Their commander has agreed to take me to his forward operating base to meet some of his men. As we head further east, he tells me that six of his men were badly injured the day before from an intense mortar strike on their position. This war has become very static. However, there's been no let up in the fighting, something that is rarely reported on the news. I finally arrive at the forward operating base where I'm going to be staying for the next few days. It's an old farm building that the Marines use to resupply food and ammo to the troops dug into the trenches on the front line. It's very similar to the setup on how we operated in Afghanistan during my military career. Now I'm here, I'm keen to get on the front line as quickly as possible as this farm building is within mortar and artillery fire range. The guy here is just showing me here is a satellite, it's an iPad and it's got all the enemy positions marked up and all the friendly forces. And when you click on the enemy position, there's a satellite photo so you can see the enemy trenches. He's going to be taking us up to the front line in a bit. And he's saying the enemy, the Russian separatists to these guys, are 498 metres from their forward line position. But looking at this, it's very linear trenches and it's very close to the enemy. The commander gives the order that it's time to go to the front line as there's going to be a changeover of manpower on the front this evening. So I don't know, I'm not really feeling nervous. It's the same as working with any other military group where I don't know their skills and their mindset on the front line. I am a bit apprehensive to see what they're like and what their skills are like. Even though Ukrainian Marines are supposed to be quite professional, there's times when I spent with other units and we've got to the front line and they're singing songs, for example, and light discipline is pretty poor. We're going to drop the vehicle off and then go on foot. We're going to go through the trench system. Sun's going down in another 20, 30 minutes. So we're going to use the cover of darkness to go right up to the front. It's about 500 meters from the enemy position. So yeah, if we hear something, like an explosion, immediately As we leave down. the vehicle, we have to cross 600 meters of open ground I'm not comfortable crossing open ground in case we are seen and the pro-Russian separatists were to launch a mortar or artillery strike. I want to get in the trench system as quickly as possible, as a deep hole will provide me with more protection if we were to come under attack. On the way to the trenches, I meet a group of Marines that have pushed back to get a resupply of water and food. They offer to provide me an escort up to their position. I finally make it to the start of the trenches that zigzag up to the front line. I'm warned to stay low as the sepsis are watching our every move. Come and have a look here. This is one of the machine gun positions here and it's a secondary fallback position. So this is like the middle of the way of the trenches. So if the guys on the front have to withdraw, they'll come back to this position here and this machine gun will give them cover and fire so they can withdraw back as they move back to their lines. So the way they work the trench system, there'll be one layer, second layer and third layer. So it's not just one straight line, but they've always got secondary and third back position to go back to, which is just common tactics from tactics countries have been doing since the First World War, if not before. Here's the saying now is, the next true line across is the Russian separatist one and also at a right angle to this position are the Russian separatists and only half their forces have taken that tree line. So really they're boxed in with the separatists. So this is sniper territory and also artillery. Yeah. 
he wants to show his position. As I make my way along the narrow trench, Ukrainian Marines along the line are happy to see me. They feel the world has forgotten about their war, so pleased to see the cameras. They tell me there was currently a ceasefire on the front line, but it's broken daily. They claim it's always the pro-Russian sepsis that fire first. Many of the Marines are in their early 20s, and the commander tells me they get paid around $500 a month. These men tell me it's their duty to stand and fight, and will remain here for as long as it takes to regain their borders. We're getting closer now, we have to move fast. Because the trench here is quite low, but this is the closest train system up to the front. <clears throat> so you can actually see the tree line now where the Russian sepsis are. And like I say, the closer we're getting, the shallower the trench becomes, which is a bit ironic. Okay, let's go forward. So what this position is here, is his phone keeps ringing even though he's on the front line. But it's a sniper position here, so they can observe the end and use the periscopes to look over the trenches. But the sides of the trenches are so narrow, it's like big shoulders, it's a struggle to get through some of these. Despite the Ukrainian military being supported by the United States, they are very limited with their modern weapons and equipment. So even though the enemy is 500 metres away, these guys are improvised a gym here in the trenches, so even in between times of getting shot at and artillery, they can still work out and they've got dips, improvised bench press and a bench, very much like when we were in Afghanistan and we didn't have any equipment, we just improvised with what we had and the fact that these guys are so close to their enemy and still working out just goes to show wherever nation you're in or what country you're in, soldiers will do the same. You've got night vision goggles and they can see. Film on you. The commander tells me that we are now entering the forward positions and that I need to stay alert as we could come into attack at any minute. That the teams change over every three, four days. And there's a changeover at the moment. Generally it's quite risky uh, when they're doing changeovers because the enemy can see there's a lot more movement there, know something's going on, know there's more guys here, so they're more likely to carry out an attack from my experience. So guys need to keep really low in these trenches to move through. There's no international volunteers on this front line at the minute, but I'm told an American is planning on joining this unit very soon. While I'm here, the Marines are keen to show me their living conditions. Here's the guy here, and he's saying there's eight to 10 men that live in here. It's like what you can imagine the First World War trenches are like. Very solid here because they've got mortars and artillery coming in, so they stay below ground. So the trench system, one minute is up to your nipples, next minute it's up to your shoulders, next minute it's down by your knee. So I think they need to dig these a little bit deeper, especially the closer we're getting, the shallower they become. But some of them, they're quite narrow in places and the guy who's shown us, keeps telling us keep down with snipers. I don't know if he's trying to embellish it to make it sound more exciting because we're here with the cameras, but there's definitely a threat here. Last time they come under artillery strike was about three days ago, but it's quiet now. And we're coming to the last light, so don't know if there's going to be more activity at night. As it gets dark, I push into one of the bunkers to provide me more protection if we were to come under attack. But they've got it zigzagging to prevent any artillery mortars that landed in that. If you're at right angles and you zigzag, the blast isn't going to hit you. So they're dug by hand, so it's taken a long time, but they've had a lot of time to prepare. They know where the enemy are. The enemy know where they are. It's a very First World War trench warfare style. And it's like going back in time, really, coming to this area with these guys. The problem is none of them know how long they're actually going to be here for, because at the moment, I don't think the septers are going to push all these guys at the moment. So it's a bit of a stalemate. As I sit waiting, I sense something is going to happen as the men on watch duty start to play loud music and whistling at their enemy. A sniper fire coming in. There's... Come on, Luke. You got it? Yeah. 
So what's going on here now is the guys in the trenches are playing music and they're drawing sniper fire. We've got rounds going straight over the heads here, which are quite close, probably about a foot on top of us. You can hear the music, they're still firing there. So what they're doing is they're playing music to draw the fire in. So the snipers from the Russian Scepters are starting to engage in this position. Now they're returning fire with the Dushka. It's a bit tit for tat, it's like boredom on the front line. Just hopefully it doesn't draw any artillery and mortars, because I don't particularly need that right now. You can still hear the music going, it's crazy. radio just gone off there and one of the sentries, the guys who's on watch has just got up and gone to the forward positions. I don't talk Ukrainian, so I don't really understand what's going on. So what's happening now is a sniper fire coming in and it's accurate. You can hear the, the whiz over the top of the head. The reason why it's coming in, I think, is because the guys are playing music. So what it's doing is just drawing the fire in now. You can hear it. And now I'm in a bit of a firefight now. It's really close. You can hear how close that rounds are. So that's now the outgoing fire from Ukrainians back. And the rounds are really accurate coming right off our head. You can hear the whiz of the rounds coming in, some sniper fire. As you can hear there, the return of fire. Just hoping no artillery or mortars come in, and it's just small arms, because we're in the trench system here, so we're protected from small arms. Even though we are quite low, you can hear the whiz coming right over the top. You can hear the fire going off there. Still waiting for the guy to come back and pick us up. The music that drew the fire in has now stopped, so clearly they put the music on to get the snipers to fire so they can engage back as well. But it's all, all quiet now on the eastern front. The only thing you can hear is the crickets at the moment and footsteps of soldiers walking back and forth along the trench, going to the positions and back again. Well, the land between, there's only 500 metres between these and the Russian separatists and if there was a large scale push they probably could take the trench systems. The commander finally returns and we agree it's time to push back to the forward operating base. The pro-Russian separatist snipers are using thermal night sights so all movement above the trenches will be seen. I have to stay low not to draw any fire as we move back towards the vehicle. It's dark and it's hard to see where we're going. So that's us now back in the vehicle, coming off the front line. Um, yeah, walking through the trenches late at night, there you couldn't see a thing, it was as black as anything. Um, but we had to keep low as well because the sniper fire was coming in so accurate. But now we're going back to the forward operating base where we're going to get our heads down for the night. I finally make it back to the forward operating base. It was disappointing not to meet any international volunteers on the front line. But I'm starting to feel Craig was right on the phone when he told me there aren't many volunteers fighting here in Ukraine anymore. The British volunteers with Azov have travelled a thousand mile round trip to Moldova to renew their visas. Tony, Sean and John applying for a residence visa so they could stay in Ukraine with Azov, the National Guard. I'm at the train station waiting for them so I can head back to their base to talk to them. At the station, the police and army do random stop and search of passengers, as this area was a flashpoint back in 2014. 
Finally, I see the men after their 17 hour train journey from Kiev. We head out of the station together to get a taxi back to their barracks. All three of these men are former British soldiers and all volunteer to go to Syria to fight Islamic State with the Kurdish YPG. They have all been in trouble with the British police for travelling to conflict zones. John tells me he was held at the border in Moldova and stopped from crossing back into Ukraine due to the stamps in his passport and the fact that he was in Syria with the YPG. So where have you been now then? Uh, we've been to Moldova to get our visas, uh, work visas, so we've got 30 days and then we've got to apply for our residency. What problems do you have at the border then? They were a bit interested in my passport stamps, so they kept me there for about two and a half hours, went through my bags, asked me where I'd been, all sorts of things. Eventually let me in, let me in and uh, then coming back out, they did it again. <laughs> so why? Why uh, I flagged it on their system. Talking with these men, it's evident they missed the sense of belonging they once had in the British Army. I know firsthand that being in a war zone is a lot easier than being in day-to-day -day Sydney Street. So I understand why these career soldiers get a sense of belonging and purpose training Ukrainian forces. Both Sean and Tony have been friends for over 25 years. I want to speak to Sean to find out what motivates him to become a career volunteer fighting in other people's wars. So why, as a British volunteer, are you here? I believe in the cause, obviously, uh, to start with, but I like to test myself, travel, uh, experience cultures. Um, I get paid to do it. Uh, also, I get paid to do something I love. Uh, I've been in the military, uh, British Army, for nine years, and uh, I get to do something I've always, always loved doing. I'm classed as a freedom fighter, but generally, um, a lot of personal aspects in my life. I, I enjoyed going away to Syria with the YPG and you know, wanted to, uh, the chance came up with the uh, Azov unit to uh, train to sort of a NATO standard level. Some people say Azov is a Nazi organization. What is your take on that? Like any organization, including the British Army, there's a, a right wing contingent in it. We don't see very much of it at all, if any. Uh, there is a contingent, maybe of small, small uh, uh, right-wing sympathisers, but always here is nationalists. Uh, generally, uh, good guys who believe in Ukraine and the freedom of Ukraine. Very, very passionate about the, the you know, their objectives, uh, and we support them, and that's all we do. I understand why soldiers miss the military once they leave. While serving, you have a sense of purpose. You're surrounded by your friends, and most importantly, you have a sense of belonging. Something many veterans struggle to find once they leave the armed forces, that many volunteers use conflicts such as this in Ukraine to get a purpose they once had in the military. You're ex-military yourself. Um, I think we both know that the answer is um, we enjoy what we do, um, especially if we're good at it. Politics aside, I mean, I have got for some political motivations, but they're not my primary, uh, primary motivation. Um, it's more about the camaraderie. You fight for the guy next to you, not, to, not for the guy above you. I think everybody's here for personal reasons. They just happen to fit in with the bigger picture. If they didn't, then you wouldn't come. I see this conflict as um, one, one nation state infringing upon the right of an, another nation state to determine its own future, even though it's by proxy. It's, it's definitely Russia. And is this course worthwhile? Well, if it helps, if it helps the nation state maintain its own sovereignty, yeah, yes. I would get knocked down crossing the road tomorrow. Volunteers that travel to war zones such as Iraq, Syria and Ukraine all know they may be in trouble with the police when they return. However, from my experience, this doesn't deter them. I'm on my way to meet Swampy again. He's a British volunteer training the National Guard on explosive and counter IED training. Swampy is from the Island Man and has been in trouble with the police for suspected terrorism offences. He was released by the police on bail and has returned to Ukraine. He's had his bank accounts frozen and despite this, tells me he will remain in Ukraine for the time being. 
a bit of abseil training, just uh, casualty drills, getting them off the building and just... Are you doing some explosions today? I might do one later, maybe. Cool. I need to make a hole, so... You want to show me up? Yeah. Just wait. Good afternoon, how are you? Right. Swampy used to be a tree surgeon in the UK and is now teaching Ukrainian troops rope skills. I'm interested to find out more about his situation with around. the police. Currently uh, under investigation for uh, fundraising and preparation for terrorism, apparently. For what terrorist group have you been working with? Uh, apparently the Ukrainian National Guard. Okay. Or the Ministry of Internal Affairs, whichever one you want. Uh, so who, who's claiming Azov are a terrorist group? Uh, gotta be careful how I answer that. Uh, yeah, no worries. Um, I don't know exactly. I just know that I've been arrested and questioned. But are you, are you on bail? Have you been charged for anything? I've not been charged for anything, uh, but I'm on bail again for the third time. Um, so I had, to, I had to go home in January uh, for some family matters and some personal matters. Um, I was arrested when I got home. Had all my bomb disposal equipment taken off me, um, all my gear, everything, laptops, uh, phones, clothing, hard drives, everything. So how, how did they leave it with you? What did they say to you then? Uh, well, initially I wasn't allowed to leave the island. Um, and I had a bail date in two months. Then they extended the bail and said because they were extending the bail, um, they couldn't they couldn't stop me from leaving the island. But you're not in breach of your bail by coming here. Uh, no, no, it's too late. I've been cut off by my bank. My bank's cut, cut me off completely. Uh, so how do you get money? I don't. I don't have money. But apart from what the apart from like the three hundred dollars that I get from the National Guard, I have no money. My PayPal's now cut me off because of the stuff to do with the bank. So I like my wages, stuff, money that I don't back home, donations that have been given to me. This maybe twelve hundred dollars, fourteen hundred dollars of mixed. Half of it is my money, and half of it is donation money, and I have no access to that. I can't. Even if the police say we need you to come back tomorrow, I can't. I don't. I have no money. I have no way to buy a flight. I've got. Even if I had money, I've got no account. How has that made you feel? Um, it's quite annoying yeah it does it make me angry yeah it take, makes me a little bit angry because I'm completely open about what I do here I publicly acknowledge what I do I publicly acknowledge who I work with I show people online what I do that's how I'm able to get donations for bomb disposal equipment it's how I'm able to get donations for medical equipment you know it's how I'm able to get stuff here and um, it's kind of just stopped me being able to operate I can't teach properly at the moment uh, because I have no access to my digital manuals well, the government are clamping down on volunteers coming into conflicts like this? Yes, uh, definitely. Um, I find it very strange, to be honest. I mean, okay, in my in my regards, I've, I've got past criminal records, so I can see them going, oh, there's a criminal and he's going to a war zone, blah, blah, blah. Because all this stuff to do with past spent convictions in the eyes of the government. What, so, what was your conviction yeah, for before? Uh, there's nothing linked to terrorism no, or no, violence or anything no, that way. But, I, I just find it funny how um, the government can turn around and say, okay, you know, there's, there's a conflict here, we need to help the Syrians or we need to help the, the Syrian Defence Force who are definitely associated with specific people um, who most people wouldn't agree that we should be backing them. Um, or we want to help the Ukrainian forces, the Ukrainian government. Um, but, you know, how dare one single person come out and do something? But some people could say you're a mercenary. Apparently so, yeah. If, if that's the case, I'm the lowest paid mercenary, I know. $100 Sorry, a, month. a month? Against, say, I don't know, Blackwater getting $500 a day. So what's $300, what's that? 170 £210 a about month? £210 a month. It pays for my cigarettes, it pays for my phone, it pays for a couple of beers. Um, I'm, now that my PayPal's been cut off, I'm really going to struggle. I don't know how I'm going to be able to get my visa, uh, which is going to run out. My temporary residency will run out in November or December. Um, if the police turn around and say, we need you to come home, I don't know how I'm going to fly home. Um, Dave. So you're stuck in a pickle, really? Yeah, I'm stuck in a pickle, but sod it. Um, you know, I'm here doing what I actually want to be doing. Um, and I might as well make this pretty much home now because thanks to this investigation, um, it's going to make, you know, because of this investigation and because they want to know the evidence for me saying I've trained here or I'm 
you know, this person has sent me equipment. So the police will now have contacted all the, the places where I've either taken uh, training for EOD or training for private security or this, that and the other. So it's going to be on record or noted that uh, I've been investigated for terrorism. So my career, even doing bomb disposal now, has been completely and utterly screwed. Conflict's going on still. It, you know, there's people either dying or getting wounded every day. And it's right on Europe's border. We should be paying attention to this. No one, no one really cares about what's going on here. So. It's clear to see Swampy's frustration and resentment towards the British police as they label him a terrorist. The Ukrainian troops tell me without international volunteers with specialist skills such as bomb disposal, more Ukrainian soldiers would die on the front line. Swampy takes me to a range to dispose okay, of an what we old have here, artillery shell. It's a 152mm artillery shell. Swampy has to return to Isle of Man soon to report for his bail hearing. Despite being labelled a terrorist by the authorities, he doesn't feel by coming to Ukraine that he actually is. Okay, stand by! Five! Four! Fire the hole! Fire the hole! Fire the hole! I've come back to meet Yala. Since I last saw him, he's been thrown out of the Ukrainian army because they accused him of having far-right views. He's a convicted bank robber and a former neo-Nazi. He believes the Norwegian government forced the Ukrainian military to discharge him and has sworn to take revenge against his government. We try, but he follows us and grabs us and stuff. Okay, we sneak away. Yeah, thank, thank you. Yeah, This fucking guy, man. Go away. What just happened there? Well, apparently we're terrorists. So I guess he's buddies with Norway then. <laughs> this drunk, crazy ass guy walks up to us, asks for our documents. From what I gather, my Ukrainian is very limited. He wants to uh, check our documents because he is police and we are terrorists. Which, um, I mean, I appreciate that he thinks that I do more than I do, but <laughs> this guy is a drunk, crazy. I, I don't even know what Why to say. Why is this guy calling you a terrorist? I don't know. Too much vodka? Maybe he drank some paint thinner instead of vodka? Guys, absolutely insane. Did you get any of that on camera? A little bit of that on camera. That was something else. <laughs> Welcome to Ukraine, baby. It's never boring here. So since last time I saw you, what's happened with you? Because last time I saw you, you were the Ukrainian army. Everything was good. And... Um, then apparently some papers arrived from Norway saying that uh, I'm the leader of some grand Nazi conspiracy or whatever. And, uh, well, I get kicked out because they don't want their reputation to be tainted. And um, So who's called you a Nazi? I guess the Norwegian government, from what I understand. And you said you're kidnapped and tortured for 10 hours. What happened? Well, I was just heading back to my place because I had an interview later that day and I had uh, to deliver my discharge papers at the recruitment station. Suddenly my face is on the ground, people are screaming at me, I'm being dragged into a police car and I get the shit kicked out of me for 10 hours, them threatening to kill and deport me and stuff like that. So Ukrainian police kidnapped you? Yes. Well, I guess you could call it cuddling if you're into that kind of stuff. So explain to me, when you were at the police station, what did they actually, how did they beat you? Oh, just punches and kicks. Very professional because, as my medical papers say, 
uh, they can see that there was severe trauma to the soft tissue, but there are no marks, no broken bones, no nothing. So why do you think they put you in the back of a police car, took you to a police station and gave you a beating for 10 hours? I don't know. Um, the National Corps has uh, some theories on it. They think maybe it's uh, Russian fifth columnists or sympathizers, or that it's a hit ordered by the Norwegian government. I simply don't know. I'll ask them next time I talk. You robbed a bank in Norway many years ago, used explosives. You're now here in Ukraine learning tactical skills and how to use weapons. Yes. You used to be a Nazi. Yes. Can you not see why people see you as a threat? No, as far as I understand, if I go back, they'll put me in prison for supposed war crimes and terrorism, um, which is amusing. Yeah, but you want to go back to Norway to get revenge on the government for the way they've treated you by branding you as a terrorist. That makes you a terrorist, though. I didn't have these opinions before they fucked me over. I was prepared to try and change things the legal way, but they fucked me over. I have no choice. They backed me into a corner without me even raising my head at them. They backed me into a corner and they gave me no way out. What, what option do I have? Give up and be put in prison for things I didn't do? If they want a monster, they'll have a fucking monster. But only for the people in charge, the people responsible for these horrible acts. Go back to Norway and carry out a terrorist attack. How would you do it? Well, I'd obviously target the government. With what? Anything necessary, I guess. As in guns, explosives, what? Or very mean and uh, strong words. Any means necessary. So when are you planning on going back to Norway to carry out these attacks in revenge? I've never said I plan to go and um, carry out attacks, but... Um, you said you want revenge on the government in Norway. Oh, yes, they screwed me over. Well, I will do what is necessary. And let us say theoretically that I were to go on a terrorist guerrilla campaign against the government, then it would not be very clever to speak about my acts, intents and actions and plans for an interview so they can see it. I guess uh, it will be a surprise. If I survive, we'll find out, won't we? I know you don't like me using the phrase terrorist, but people will say you are a terrorist for saying these kind of things. And you know that. If you want to make an omelette, you've got to break some eggs. And the only way to make change is to remove the people in power. And to remove the people in power, sadly, you have to fight because people in power will not give up their power, no matter what. And a lot of people are hearing what I'm speaking. They're hearing the message. They appreciate it. So I guess they're worried that there will be an uprising or something along these lines, which is not entirely impossible. I survive, I'm going to bring my merry band of adventurers and we're going to go and pay a visit to the Norwegian government and uh, we'll see uh, what happens, I guess. We'll see who wins. So you prepared to use violence? Yes. Why am I here in Ukraine? I'm prepared to do anything it takes to make a change. But what makes you different to Bin Laden, al-Baghdadi, ISIS? What, what makes you any different to these organizations? Nothing, really. I will do my absolute utmost to make sure that no innocent people are harmed in any way. It's the same way I did it with the bank robbery. That's why we went in at night when there was no one there. We didn't even want to traumatize anyone or scare anyone. We're about fucking the guys at the top who are fucking around with everyone else. My goal is not to fuck with the innocent. My goal is not to fuck with civilians. My goal is not to kill people who are just trying to go through their daily life. I'm merely biding my time, training my people, bringing them in to try and make a change. And I would do the same for anyone else. So you could say you're a terrorist facilitator then? I guess you could use that terminology. What terminology would you use? Mm. I guess you could say I'm the very definition of the Robin Hood complex. Victory or Valhalla, brother. Since being discharged from the Ukrainian army, he has now been made homeless. He's staying at an abandoned holiday park on the outskirts of Kiev that's owned by the National Corps. He's keen to show me where he will be training his new recruits in the coming months. 
this place here now, this is your new training establishment here. There's two of you here at the moment. But you're telling me lots of international volunteers are coming over to join you and your cause. Talk me through what you're planning with these men when they come here. What this is, is uh, grounds we have been borrowed by the people we are working with. And this is supposed to be a training facility or, uh, and a housing facility for uh, the people who come here to fight for Ukraine. And uh, later then, when this situation has stabilized and we have done what we are supposed to, or the time is right, I will leave with uh, however many of my supporter, supporters wishes to go. And uh, there will be every attempt to make this happen peacefully. I will try to do activism from here and talk with media and different things about these problems. Try to bring this situation to light. But if there is no other choice, they back me into a corner. I can't go home. I can't go to Norway again, so if there is no other option, then I will use whatever means are necessary. But do you not see how someone watching this would say, this guy's mental, he, he is a blatant terrorist. And if you were a Muslim telling me this, people were like, this guy is potentially going to go join Islamic State. What makes you any different to them people? What makes you different to someone that goes into a stadium in Manchester with a suicide vest and blows herself up? Because what you're saying, things they were saying to their friends before they carried out these attacks. Originally I was just going to come here and there was a group of friends coming to support Ukraine but now it's become a bit bigger than that. It's uh, trying to make a change in the world, trying to remove these corrupt politicians, remove this media, try to change the world into a better place. So Norwegian government will call you a terrorist but you're telling me you're not a terrorist, what are you? The difference between a terrorist and a government is that the one can afford a jet plane, the other cannot. But they're one and the same, really. The only difference between a freedom fighter and a terrorist is if media supports them or is against them. Nelson Mandela is taught about in school as a freedom fighter, but he killed people in absolutely horrible ways and targeted civilians. So, you know, it's all about definition. Yeah, but you're talking about blowing up potential government buildings, attacking policemen and soldiers, people that represent the state of Norway. That's terrorism. You can't sugarcoat it any other way. That is a terrorist act. If it's not possible to remove them by peaceful means, then they're driving the earth to the ground and they're causing hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of deaths all over the world, all the time, every day, directly or indirectly, by their choices and actions. Is it better to sit idly by and do nothing? So what do you think has brought you to this moment now, that you want to make change in Norway against the government? Well, everything was okay, but uh, I guess just got to that point where I was backed into a corner and I had no way out, so might as well uh, walk the talk, might as well make the change. If I'm going to be put away for something I didn't do, I might as well try and do it for the best. You're saying you're not going to go to prison? You're going to go down fighting. Yeah. What does that mean? It means if they're trying to imprison me for make, trying to make a change, then uh, I am going to resist. I'm not going down. I'm so not you're going to go up. down fighting? Yeah. To the last drop. How am I going to go to Valhalla if not fighting? Despite the other originally coming to support Ukrainian military, his ideology has changed. He's treading a fine line that will either get him arrested or killed, proving that allowing international volunteers to fight unvetted is potentially dangerous to national security. Not all the international volunteers that have come to Ukraine have gone to fight for the Ukrainian forces. There's many international volunteers that have gone over to the pro-Russian separatist side. One individual is Ben Stimson from the UK. Benjamin Stimson was sentenced to five years, four months at Manchester Crown Court when he pleaded guilty to terrorism charges for joining the pro-Russian separatists. In court, David Stockdale QC said, you ultimately did no physical harm to anyone, but you assist assisted the militia by your presence and your involvement, and you were given lead to others. I accept you do not hold extremist views and you have expressed your regret for your actions. It just goes to show that men who have gone to this conflict to join the pro-Russian separatists and the Ukrainian forces are being investigated by the police for terrorism charges because the UK government doesn't recognise volunteers going to conflict zones. Well, my name is Russell Bentley. I'm from Texas in the United States. 
They came to Donetsk in December 2014, Jordan joined the Nova Russian Army Vostok Battalion. I'm not the only American citizen that's been here and worked here. Although the Donetsk People's Republic is not listed by the United States as a terrorist organization, uh, although what I have done here does not fall under the legal definition of being a mercenary. Um, and although I'm not aware of any specific U.S. laws that I have broken, I have absolutely no doubt that I would be arrested as soon as I returned and uh, never see the light of day again. You know, I mean, uh, the way the law is set up in the United States, uh, kind of like as it is in Britain now, uh, they can do anything they want for any reason they want. Uh, and once they got you, they can hold on to you as long as they feel like it. Conflict here and the one in Syria do have a lot of parallels to the Spanish Civil War. And those dudes, their competence level probably isn't uh, high enough for them to come around to the other side. Second of all, because it's also easier if you accept the uh, dominant paradigm if you accept bullshit that the Western media and the Western government is shoveling, then you're like, oh, I'm going to go be a hero. And all your stupid friends and your family are like, yeah, he's a patriot. He's going to fight the Russian aggression over there, you know? I mean, it saves them the trouble of actually having to think and analyze the real situation. They just, I mean, it's just like dudes that, uh, you know, Germans that joined the Wehrmacht back in the 30s and 40s, you know? You're like, oh, it's a patriotic thing to do because I saw it on TV or I read it on a poster, so I'm gonna go do it. And so, I mean, the people that have come here, foreign volunteers to support Donbass republics, you know, first of all, they've seen through the bullshit. Second of all, they've analyzed the situation. And third, they've been, you know, determined and competent enough to come the long way around, to go you know, to go the hard way around, and they're fighting for the underdog. They're fighting for the good guys who are being oppressed, not just by the Ukrainian army, by, you know, but by all of the uh, Western NATO fascists that control their Ukrainian army. This war is to destabilize Ukraine in order to destabilize Russia. And the people that call the shots, which is the IMF, NATO, and the US, they do not care at all about the people of Ukraine or what happens to the country of Ukraine. All they want to do is make, is they want to turn this place into the European Libya. And so it gives headaches to, to uh, Russia. And they don't care how many people get killed on either side. They do not care. I mean, this is, uh, you know, this is a cross between a mercenary base, a whorehouse, and, uh, you know, a place for, for the West to pillage. The conflict in Ukraine has been going on for over four years now. And despite the ceasefire, there's no let up in the fighting. The war now in 2018 is very different to what it was in 2014, because it's very static, it's trench warfare, but it's still very active. Something the media and the press aren't reporting on. These volunteers that have come to this conflict have now seen it for what it is and have decided it's not worth fighting. But I still question what motivates these men to fight in other people's wars. A lot of people accuse Russia and America of using Ukraine as a proxy war. This really is Europe's forgotten war. Who honestly comes to a country at war um, as a tourist to come to a country to fight in a war? Different motivations. Some people just want to see justice done, just want to help out somebody getting attacked and uh, people run towards war. Sometimes they don't understand why they do it. Maybe they're just bored with their life. Maybe they miss war. Maybe they never got uh, sent to a war zone when they were in the military. Maybe they always like to play airsoft or Call of Duty and think that war is the same thing. Um, I've never been able to press the B button rapidly to bring back a, a friend or wait for them to respawn. Um, what I can say is maybe more about uh, some Europeans and maybe a couple of Americans I ran across. Uh, if you come to a country that's at war, you either help out or you get the fuck out of the way. Um, you either go to the front lines to support and assist people 
um, or you do some training, uh, you provide some aid, maybe some donations, uh, but it's a war zone at the end of the day. You can't just go to an American war zone um, in Iraq or Afghanistan um, or go to Syria now and just be there to spectate. Unless you're, you know, the journalist credentials, you have to have some reason to be there. And Ukraine was different. You could get past the front, you know, the, the blog posts easily. Just slip in without credentials, nothing. Just pop on in, pop on out. People would come there. Um, they didn't maybe have, I think, the best intentions. Maybe something was missing inside. Maybe something was black inside. These people are not the people that the American military would let in or let back in, if that was the case. These people were the people who do not represent my country and I hope don't represent their European nation as a normal member of the society. Uh, these people, in my opinion, came here because they wanted to just hurt somebody. Maybe they were hurt inside. They just wanted to put that hurt out on somebody else. And that's not why you go to a war zone. That's not what you do. You just make the situation worse. You put the Ukrainians in more danger by aggravating the situation more by coming here just to, just to kill somebody. Anybody can take a life. Few people want to save a life. But don't come to a war zone. Don't come to a place where my brothers and sisters are fighting for their homeland and think that you're going to help help them because you're an American or a European with some questionable military experience. So for anybody out there listening, watching this, think that they're interested in coming to the Ukrainian war, have a soul search before you come off here, get off the airport at Borispol. Because if I catch you, or if any of my team catches you, or any of our friends catch you out there acting like an idiot, doing something on the front line, your ass is going back home, or your ass is going to jail. Because we don't want you here. Strike a man.